Welcome to worship, however and whenever you may be joining us. My name is Kenji Marui, and the pronouns I use are he and him, and I am part of the pastoral team with Grace United Church, an inclusive intergenerational community partner. As an affirming ministry of the United Church of Canada, we welcome, celebrate, and support people of every gender expression and sexual orientation. As people of faith, we are people of the Word, God's Word, Jesus Christ called Logos, the Bible known as the Living Word. Moral character is built upon our word being our bond. Our words of treaty with indigenous nations may not be the best example. We live upon treaty lands and waters, as described in Treaty 29, the Huron Tract Purchase in 1827 for Sarnia Lampton. Where I am recording in Strathroy Caradoc, Treaty 21, the Longwoods Purchase, 1819, of the Upper Canada Crown Treaties. These contracts and covenants made between Anishinaabe representatives and the Government of Canada are painfully one-sided, rooted in historical, systemic racism that continues to this day. We do note some points of progress. As Black History Month concludes, I will add that the Act for the Abolition of Slavery throughout the British Colonies received royal assent and became law throughout the British Empire on August 28, 1833, coming into force on August 1, 1834. Prior to this in Upper Canada, now Ontario, in 1793, Governor General John Graves Simcoe passed the Anti-Slavery Act. This law freed enslaved people aged 25 and over and made it illegal to bring enslaved people into Upper Canada. This year marks the 187th anniversary of the total abolition of slavery in Canada. We pause to acknowledge this moment in history. We remember as we worship and commit ourselves to continue to work for a world where righteousness and justice will be found everywhere. As we gather in worship now, we deliberately slow this rush of time, carving out space and moments of meaning so that we might connect with the divine, with one another, and with ourselves. In this season of Lent, we reflect and respond to the covenants and promises we have with God through Christ in the Spirit. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you find something of what you might be looking for. As we center ourselves, Glenn leads us into the first moments of worship now.
At this point, I'll invite you to get a candle ready, if you have one on hand, something we can light together as we prepare this space for worship. The cross stands before us as a beacon of promise and everlasting grace, a symbol of everlasting life. The horizontal bar reaches out, embracing us with compassion. The vertical bar points upward as a sign of awe and downward to the ground of our being. I place a symbol of our identity, our calling by name, onto the cross. Name tags, blank and unfilled, upon which we place ourselves. Light and warmth are returning to the land outside of these walls. Light and warmth are represented in the light that glows from the flames. May the symbol of this lit candle, the Christ candle, remind us of the reality of the land and the light and the warmth of our presence with God. As we light, as we have lit this Christ candle, we extinguish another one of these Lenten lights as the journey toward the cross looms in the distance. Come, let us worship. Come, let us sing, for this is the day. This is the day, this is the day that our God has made, that our God has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day. At this point in the service, people on the Zoom call have gone into breakout rooms to share the peace of Christ and reflect on a story or experience about name changes. Whether we're given the nickname or reclaim the name with which we were born or, or find a new name that better suits our identity, God knows us and calls us by name and loves us dearly. We seek to live in the way of the one God called El Shaddai, Elohim, Adonai, or the name that should not be spoken. 
We follow in the path shown us by God's beloved child, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. In his peace, we find our place of belonging, acceptance, and love. The peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Check this out. Have you seen this before? Can you make out what's going on in this beautiful picture, this beautiful piece of art? There's a body of a person named Sarah. This is her head with the name Sarah in it. These are her arms and her torso and her legs down here. And standing in behind Sarah is the body of a person named Abraham. There's his head, it says Abraham, and you can see his brown arms reaching up, and there's his torso in behind Sarah's, and his brown legs reaching down. Can you see that? It's a pretty sweet piece of art. What makes this even sweeter is that Sarah and Abraham's bodies make up the trunk of a tree. And their arms and their hair stretch out to make up the branches of a tree. Can you see that? That's pretty sweet, eh? And it gets better. You see all these lines in the branches and lines in their body? Well, they're not really lines. They're actually letters. And they're not just letters, but they are names. There are 2,000 166 names printed into this picture, all handwritten by my sister-in-law, whose name also happens to be Sarah. Sarah made this beautiful piece of art for us to remind us of the story that we're going to hear today. The story of this old, old couple, Sarah and Abraham, and how God told them that they were going to be parents. And when he told them that, Sarah and Abraham, of course, laughed. You know, <laughs> we're too old to be parents. And God said, no, you're going to be parents. Well, not only parents, you're going to be grandparents. And you're going to be great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents and so on. And again, Sarah and Abraham said, uh, no, I don't see that gig going down. And God said, no, yeah, you're going to have so many children. You're going to have so many grandchildren. You're going to have so many great grandchildren and great, 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 great grandchildren. You won't even be able to keep count. Well, sure enough, Sarah and Abraham had a child and they called him Isaac. Now you can see that Sarah has a baby in her womb and you see the word Isaac there. These are our great, 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 grandparents. These are our grandparents going back thousands and thousands of years. These are our ancestors in the faith. This is Sarah and Abraham's family. And your name is likely printed somewhere in this beautiful piece of art. I know where mine is. And if you send me your name, I'll find it here and I'll send you a picture of it. May God bless you as you continue to learn the names and the stories of our ancestors. Let's take a moment to recall one of our ancestors in the faith, whether it's a blood relative that was instrumental in bringing your faith alive or even an ancestor in the faith that you met on the page. Let's take a moment.
for the gift of this God who comes to us and gives us our name and gives us our life's calling. We offer thanks. Amen. Previously, in the book of Genesis, Abram uproots his successful life in Haran to start all over again in the land of Canaan. He and his wife Sarai had been unable to have children, even though God promised that he would have many descendants. After many unfruitful years of trying, Sarai tells Abram to have a child with her slave girl, Hagar. He does so, and he and Hagar have a son, Ishmael. It would seem that the promise was kept but that wasn't exactly what God had in mind. Sarai herself would also be greatly blessed as we learn of a new covenant promise. 
a reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 to 8 and 15 to 16. Listen for the inspired word of God. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all the land of Canaan for a perpetual holding, and I will be their God. God said to Abraham, As for Sari, your wife, you shall not call her Sari, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bill, for the reading. Let us pray. Loving Creator, we give thanks for the gifts of these, these moments of covenant and call, care and connection. This morning we ask that the prayers that we pray, the songs that we sing, the words that we say and hear be blessed by you. O oh God, our strength, our refuge, and our Redeemer. Amen. Abram was a man of singular faith. He was Jewish before that religion was even created. He lived amid a society that has had established a broad and diverse mythology of many gods and goddesses for many various and unique elements of the world. There were goddesses and gods for each tree, mountain, river, plant, star, rock, and weather phenomenon. Abram's faith was contrary to this grand array of deities. He believed in one God. It was controversial. How could the God of fire also be the goddess of water? How could the goddess of birth also be the God of death? Yet Abram knew beyond the contradictions of our earthly perception that there was a greater being with grander purpose than ours at work in the world. The story of his life was uprooted very abruptly in his retirement after a successful career in Haran, when God calls him to relocate to the land of Canaan, a land of milk and honey. There is the promise of children and descendants, which was a sore point for him and his wife Sarai. Almost 24 years after that first call to Abram, is this covenant presented, as Bill read this morning. God confirms the promise and agreement made earlier, that Abram's children would spread throughout the land and the entire world, numbering as stars in the sky and grains of sand in the desert. At the ripe old age of 99, we are reminded of God's promise as a symbol and sign of this, and Abram's name is changed. With apologies in advance, I am going to get very nerdy here. One letter is added. The Hebrew letter He, 
with the vowel adjunct comets to make an ah sound. Abram becomes Abraham. And the same for Sarai, who becomes Sarah. I present this very brief introduction to the Hebrew alphabet because we also need to examine God's own holy name. As the Hebrew scriptures progress, we will discover that the Israelites had a secret weapon in their dealings with their rivals and enemies. And this secret weapon was the knowledge of what God's name actually was. There was thought to be mystical power in identifying someone or something by name that binds it to the will of the namer. We see something similar in how some black lives are trying to reclaim the N-word or how the gay and lesbian community uses queer to describe itself. Naming something gives you power over it, which is why it was important for Adam in the creation narrative to name the animals. And one of the Ten Commandments is not to take the Lord's name in vain. Are you ready for what God's name is? It's four letters long in Hebrew. And to keep it a secret, the Israelites didn't pronounce it the way that it was spelled. And this is what it looks like. Reading right to left, the letters are yud Hey vav Hey. And English transliteration is J-H-V-H. Add in some vowels, and we might be more familiar with Jehovah, except that doesn't really mean anything. It really is a nonsense word. The Hebrew pronunciation is Yahweh, but the word is not read that way in the Bible. To preserve this secret, these four letters are used with vowel vocalizations from another word. That other word is Adonai, which means Lord. If you look in our Bibles today, you might notice the word Lord, when referring to God, is capitalized. Now, this is not some mere font fanciness, but an, an acknowledgement that what we were saying was a substitute for the private, personal name of the divine. So why this lesson in Biblical Hebrew? Well, I wanted to emphasize what a great big deal God's name is and explore what it means that Abram's and Sarai's names were expanded by one letter. The comet's hey vowel combination, the ah that was inserted into their names, is present in God's own name, Yahweh, Jehovah, Adonai. When God changes their names, it is as if God put a bit of God's own self in there. Some of the divine identity is now firmly entrenched in their name. They are called and claimed as God's own, taking on an element of the Eternal's power and presence with them wherever they go, as they are in their identity. Not bad for a pair of nonagenarians. And there are many reasons why we resist God's call. We come up with any number of excuses. Isaiah was not righteous enough. Moses was terrified of public speaking. Mary was not married. Jeremiah was too young. Abram and Sarai were too old. God works through us, in spite of us. Our age is not a barrier to trusting in a greater good, contributing in some way to the needs of those around us of connecting with family and friends. When we align with God's purpose, we are changed. Abram knew this, and God knew that Abram knew this, giving him a new name as a sign, Abraham, meaning father of a multitude. But this is more than just Abraham's origin story. A grievously overlooked aspect of this covenant is the expansion to include Sarah, her husband, after all, had got what he wanted. He already had a son, begotten with another woman, and his legacy was secure. Here, God makes covenant with Sarah, too. She will give birth to nations, to kings. Her impact and influence will echo through the generations. This is not just an old boys club between God and Abraham. Sarai joins the covenant and is also renamed Sarah meaning princess. 
She is affirmed and valued, vital to the movement of ministry that would be borne by multitudes that would name her their mother. She's not just Abraham's wife. She's not defined by who she belongs to. Sarah is a fully realized person with agency and will and faith who changed the world. Abram and Sarai are permanently changed by their faith, in body, in spirit, and in name. For their willingness to follow in the way of the one true God, Yahweh, for their aged bodies to be altered by circumcision, pregnancy, and childbirth, for, for their belief and trust, for their names to fit around the letters of God's own self, their spirits carry the very essence and breath of the holy and divine. As people of faith ourselves, we might struggle with the patriarchal and paternalistic messages that are inherent in our biblical texts. And we may question the chronology and calendar of ancient days that allowed for lifespans that were centuries long. But we recognize that no one meets God and remains unchanged. After all, a genuine promise, a true covenant, changes who we are, shapes our interaction with the other permanently. I'll conclude by saying again, God knows us by name. God dwells in the core of each person. God loves the person that we are and the blessing that we can be to the world. Let us live into that identity of greatness and tradition of trust. As a church and as a people, we are, as Sarah and Abraham, people of faith filled with God's power and passion, fully realized people with agency and will to change the world. Let us do so in God's name, which is also ours. Amen. Let us pray. Our Creator, we make our prayers to you. Choosing an aged, barren couple to parent your holy people, calling us to set aside ourselves and to shoulder a cross, showering us with love and mercy when we do nothing to deserve these gifts. 
you always act in ways which surprise us, O God of our parents and ancestors. In hospital rooms where we wait in anxious expectation, in essential workplaces and isolated homes where we worry and wonder, in this unholy mess we call life, you always call us to faithfulness and trust, O Christ, the cross-bearer for us all. In this time together now, we lift up our prayers for Doug, Marge, Audrey, Tracy, Curtis, Jessica, Candace, Marion, and the people of Texas. And in the silence that is before us, we lift up our prayers for those who are in our hearts and on our minds, for those names being listed in the chat box now. In the warmth of spring's approach, we hear your voice. In the moonlight of winter's shortening nights, we see your face. In the silence of a child sleeping, we are breath in your grace. You are always with us in the ordinary moments of life, spirit of holiness. God and community, holy in one, may we see you, hear you, and know you as we move through this Lenten season, praying as Jesus taught us, to God, our parent and our provider, our mother and our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
God's promises endure from generation to generation. May the God of Abraham and Sarah, the God who sent Jesus to redeem us, the God whose covenant is eternal, bless us and make us fruitful. May the love of God, the passion of Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all this and every day. Amen.